And I duel the always outspoken Mark Levine over our favorite mortgage giants, Fannie and Freddie. And we'll also get into some of the nitty gritty of Greenspan and Bernanke's manipulation of interest rates. Stay tuned. All right, joining me as host of the Inside Scoop, Mark Levine. Let me ask you something. How long have you been in the broadcasting business? About 10 years now. 10 actually. years. You've yeah. got an edge on me. But I have these things called facts. So let's get to our first story. <laughs> I don't need the, the uh, cheat sheet. I know them already. Oh, let's man. go. Makes me look bad already. This week, Fannie Mae announced a $10 billion second quarter profit, partially, partially due to surging home prices. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, President Obama laid out a plan to wind down both mortgage giants, Fannie and Freddie. So would this be the same Freddie that led to a you know, collapse in the housing market. Aren't you glad that President Obama did such a great job in bailing them out? They're not only going to pay every penny that they borrowed, they're going to make substantial profits. And the best part is the American taxpayer owns 80% of Freddie Mae and, and guess, Freddie Mac. That's how that happened. It, that would never have happened were it not for the Federal Reserve buying over a billion, actually over a trillion dollars worth of those securities. The market was tanking, and were it not for the Federal Reserve's manipulation of interest rates, we would have never had this uh, paying all this money back. It gets to moral hazard. So what do you think about the moral hazard involved? Uh, to me, look, I've always argued that we shouldn't have things that are too big to fail. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were private enterprises like AIG and, and, and countrywide, frankly. Hey, still and, private. Well, no, they were completely private. Remember, they've been private since 1968. They're only public now because they were bailed out by President Obama. Okay, but in the, they were private in the sense that you could buy shares in them, but also the public government was backstopping them. No, but, no, yes. no. If, if you look, any securities you bought from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac said very clearly I, the, the U.S. government is not backing any of this. With a wink was, and a nod, they did. The, and they actually ended up backing them in, at the last minute. No more than AIG, no less than AIG, also a private, a private company that okay. actually did a lot worse than Fannie Mae or Freddie Yes, they did. But the Federal Reserve was buying agency bonds that would be Freddie and Fr Fannie and Freddie agency bonds since 1999. So the Fed had already given support. I, I, I don't think China would have bought all those bonds in the first place had the Fed not been active in the market. So to say that they were a private enterprise, I think, is a false misconstruction. But here's the heart of it. At the end of the day, we're getting all our money back and we're making a profit, which shows that it was a good idea to bail them out. Now, should we have anything too big to fail in the future? No, we shouldn't. That's why, as you know, I support the Dodd-Frank regulation bill. That's why I I think that these, all of these entities, private and public, need to be regulated so they're not too big to fail in the future. I agree that we shouldn't have too big to fail, but how did we get here in the first place? Okay. So let's talk about how we got here in the first place. All right, the we, we, we got here because the Republican Congress okay. got rid of regulations. They got rid of Glass-Steagall. That's they true. They got rid of the bucket shop laws that had been around since the early 1900s that prevented you from gambling on other people's things. Look, if I buy house insurance, all right, and I have a fire, I get recovery. But I shouldn't be able to bet on whether your house burns down or bet ten times on whether your, house, are, your house burns down because then I might have an incentive to burn your house down. Okay, those are two separate arguments. So let me get to Glass-Steagall first. First, if we have to live with the banking system that we have, I'm all in favor of that wall. Are we going to get that wall again? I doubt it unless there's another financial crisis. But then what was your second point? Well, my point is you shouldn't be able to bet on other people's mistakes. The whole point of insurance, the whole point of hedging is to protect yourself. Like I said, like fire insurance. What credit derivative swaps did, as you know, is it lets you bet on other people's mistakes. Right. So Goldman Sachs could sell these terrible, terrible uh, collateralized debt obligations to people at the same time as they bet against the same things they were selling. It, that kind of betting and that kind of non-regulated capitalism that is the cause of the crisis. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they jumped in, no question about it. They jumped in late, they jumped in much smaller than everybody else, and frankly, they're partly to blame, but very, very small part to blame. Well, I would say that a lot of the blame gets back to the Federal Reserve, because when you look at CDOs and the derivatives market, $700 trillion back up to the pre-crisis levels, CDOs didn't make up that big of a part. It's interest rate swaps and other things. Those are the things that are going to detonate the system in the future. And getting to your point of should you be able to bet on other people's houses, I think it's a non sequitur, because the reason we have the $700 trillion derivatives market in the first place is because the Fed has been giving away free money for over a decade. Now, the reason we have this derivatives market is because Wall Street has found that this is a fancy way to act without regulation. You know why they're called credit derivative swaps and not insurance, which is really what they are? Or that because swaps weren't regulated. This was this new word created by some brilliant guy at Merrill Lynch. Uh, I'm going to call it swaps because that's not insurance, that's not banks. 
the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation has done a very good job at regulating banks. That's why we haven't seen a run on the Treasury with that. We need the exact same thing, a Federal Mortgage Insurance Corporation, make sure that non-banks have the same regulations. This won't happen again. Yeah, I don't think we're seeing eye to eye here. I think the... <laughs> so let's move... Do we ever, Bob? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Let's move on to our second topic. <laughs> America's wealthiest are stashing their cash, according to a survey by American Express Publishing and the Harrison Group. The top 1% of Americans save 37 cents for every dollar earned. This is triple the savings rate of the top 1% in 2007. So interest rates are already at near zero. We've been talking about this. What do you think about cash hoarding? Well, it seems to me that obviously the rich have so much cash that they have no place to, to put it. Look, the top 1% earn 11% more each year the last three, four years, while the bottom 99%, which is the vast majority of us, right. lose money year after year. We have a system, let's face it, that rewards the super rich at the expense of everybody else. That's what, Bill, that's what uh, Barack Obama's been arguing for a long time. We need to tax the rich more fairly so that the money gets distributed more fairly across the public. Okay, but how does the money get there in the first place? How, do the, how come we've seen this huge disparity in wealth grow throughout the years is it because of lax regulations I mean is it partly isn't, isn't the heart of it that you know the basically we've been, just been giving money away to corporations we've had a crony capitalist system and some of these corporations themselves are almost too big to fail and a lot of these defense co contractors like GE derive a significant p portion of their income from you know, the federal government. Look, I'm not going to defend corporate welfare. I've been opposed to corporate welfare all the time I've been in politics. But the heart of the problem is, is that if you're a middle class family and you have a small business and you do badly at the business, you fail, you lose your business. But yes. if you're extremely rich, you can ruin a company, have the stock price decrease by two thirds and still get out with hundreds of millions of dollars in bailout. That's not capitalism the way it should be. If Goldman Sachs went to jail or lost a lot of money, that would be keep people from making these kinds of mistakes in the future. Well, here's the moral hazard argument that goes to to the, the AIG bailout and everything else is that when the government picks winners and losers, it does hurt the small businesses. And that's the final word. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining me. If you want to weigh in on today's show, be sure to like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash prime interest. You can follow Mark here at Mark Levine Talk, and you can fo follow me at English PI. Thank you so much for joining me on today's Daily Duel. My pleasure, Bob. Dueling, Bob went to war with Mark Levine over capitalism itself. So thanks for watching.